World Championship canoeing here on Eurosport. It's the biggest race since Sydney 2000. We have the final of the men's K1. The men's kayak, we're in Bourg Saint-Maurice in the French Alps. I'm Bassels Alexander. With me, former British team member, two times Olympian, and former World Championship gold medalist, Ian Raspin. And Ian, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting afternoon. We've got um, the French uh, Fabien Lefebvre showing just how dominant he's been this season. Got a three-second lead at the moment. I wonder if anybody uh, is going to be good enough to take that away from him in the second runs. Here you see the river Isère in Bourg saint -Marie's in Savoie. Those red poles have to be negotiated upstream. The green gates downstream. And as we saw in the semi-finals this morning, this is a mighty tough course. Only the French world number one, as you said, Ian Fabien Lefebvre, really mastered it. For the rest, it was a case of who could have fewer mistakes. All to play for, the top 10 from the semi-finals go in reverse order, and the aggregate times added together to sort out the placings. Fairly open field, not too many would have predicted this top 10 ahead of the World Championships. Here you can see the course downstream through the green gates, upstream a loop through the red ones. Just to reiterate the rules, any pole hit is a two-second penalty added to your time. You may be able to get away with one of those, but not one of these. If you miss a gate, and that's a 50-second penalty, and you can kiss goodbye any chance of a medal. Confirmation, then, of the top ten. They'll go in reverse order. The leader after the semi-finals, Fabien Lefebvre of France, a staggering 90.67 run, clean and quick in the semi-finals. Sam Oud of the Netherlands just misses out by 0.1 of a second in a place in the final. Micha Terdik. This was his semi-final run. He's lying in third place. An inauspicious start. You saw that two-second penalty. There you go, upstream through the red gates, downstream through the green ones. The course the same as the semi-final, and this was the tricky bit. From gate 12 to gate 13, that's where we saw so many of the big names come to grief. Unlucky 13 for so many of the big favourites, including the 1996 Olympic champion, Pier Pablo Ferrazzi of Italy, including the reigning Olympic champion, Thomas Schmidt, many people's tip for the title. He came to grief on gate 13, and his world championship is over. Mikhail Terdik of Slovenia then, he took provisional second place after his semi-final run. And very, very close to the river. But Ian, after such a tricky and difficult first run of the course, they've got a feel of it now. They know just how hard it is. Mm -hmm. What's going through their minds? How on earth does anyone catch Fabien Lefebvre? Um, it's a good question. I think it was uh, just worth uh, showing Mia there. Mia's actual running time was, uh, was only just, uh, it was 92.96. Uh, uh, so he was just just under two seconds uh, behind. 
and two seconds as we've seen on here is uh, you know we, it can come and go fairly easily it only needs one slight mistake so um, there is the possibility that Fabian could take a penalty and then he is within striking distance so I don't think it's all wrapped up yet I think there's uh, there's still a lot could go on in these second runs well certainly with this course you'd be surprised if anyone could produce a run like Lefebvre's first run twice in a row if he does of course he'll be crowned world champion and deservedly so <laughs> Andre Raab of the Czech Republic is lying in second place this was his semi-final run good strong finish A, a good run from Andre. He's uh, had a fifth this year, but that's as good as it's got. So I think he'll be excited to see what he can do on the second run. They've been magnificent, the supporters. Packing the banks of the river. 6,000 a day have come and enjoyed the sunshine and enjoyed some top quality canoeing. And none better than this semi-final run from the world number one on home water with the home fans cheering his every move. This was just about perfect. I think Ian, the other nine competitors, would do well to watch a video of this. This is how to get from gate 12 to gate 13. Yeah, I would say par with the rest of his run, that was pretty good. Um, there are a couple of the guys who were, uh, I would say, equally as good as Fabian around there, but um, it wasn't just that part of the course that produced the results this morning. I think uh, if you broke down the run into, into the sections, as do the teams, when they're analysing their performance, as they will have done before the second runs, they're re reviewing the video footage, they're reviewing the split times, they're the times of each section down the course. And I think what we'll see there is that Fabian generally was uh, probably one of the quickest in all three, all, all three or four sections of the course, normally broken into sections. And uh, as a result, that's what we've seen. Fully three and a half, three and a third seconds ahead of the field. The weather just about perfect. It's sun time, suntan lotion time in the French Alps. Hardly a breath of wind. And this is the big one. The biggest race since Sydney 2000. The final of the K1 men, the men's kayak world championships. And this is the starting order, the top ten in reverse order. So first to go, Carlos Jon Marti Santiago of Spain, the world number 65. He has done very, very well to get to this stage. Lying just over five and a half seconds behind our leader. And Ian, just to, to reiterate, this world championship, the first since 1999. Now the judges, eagle-eyed by every gate, but uh, three years ago, Less than a second separated the top nine this time round. Lefebvre, three and a half seconds ahead of the best of the rest. So, a uh, very different world championship. Certainly in the top three there, but if we just look outside of that through four through to ten, there's actually only a second separating fourth place through to ten. So there's a, there's a fierce battle going on just outside of the top three. Whether anyone can break inside, we'll just have to wait and see. times from the two qualifying heats the scrap but the semi-final time and the final times added up the man with the best aggregate and will be crowned world champion so far so good for Carlos Yonmati Santiago the precocious Spaniard no 
split times yet, of course. He is the first to go down. Just a two-second penalty so far. But Ian, he, he seems to be picking pretty much the right line. Yeah, his, uh, his run so far doesn't look too bad. It's a little bit difficult to gauge as, we're, uh, as he is the first put down. But yeah, his boat seems to be uh, running fairly well. Boats are spending most of its time traveling in a downstream direction. Not too much sliding around. It's like a motor car. You want the back wheels to follow the front. And that's what they're aiming at. 197.62. And there's the benchmark. Nine to go. A couple of two-second penalties. He'll be cross with himself, especially for that one. And here goes Dejan Crouch. That's Slovakian, one of the favourites coming into this tournament. Clean run in his semi-final. He could do with another one here. I think that was a penalty there on gate four. We'll have to wait and say yes. A penalty given on gate four, so that's going to spoil his second run. Very good spot. I think to come home from the World Championship saying you were 10th is not too bad, but uh, he was in striking distance of the top, uh, top four places, and I think he's just given that away with that penalty. His running time is first from 96.3. Good though through 12 and 13. Part of the course that was so many to come to grief this morning in the semi-finals. Well up at the second split though. these last few gates 19 especially it's a case of how much energy is left in the tank how much you can eke out of the arms and shoulders they're hurting by now aren't they I think that's a pretty good time 192.28 shame about the uh, two-second penalty but the Slovenian fans pleased with their man Two Slovenians in this top ten. Mikitaric, we saw his first run earlier. He's lying in third place. But here's Costa Luca of Italy. A first taste of a world championship podium in the team event. Can he just love it? Silver medal in the men's team kayak. And that seems to have spurred him on. Yeah, I don't think Costa's featured on the medal roster before. It's just looking back over some of his results. I think his best result was uh, a second position in the uh, in the pre-worlds that's this event last year in the qualification event so not the final the qualification so he's a you know he's a newcomer to the medal roster and if he can do that today certainly in the individual event yes and fast through that first section well up on the split Clean through 12, but there we go. The first man to come to grief on gate 13, Costa Luca, has just seen his medal hopes die. Going back for another crack at it. If he does get through it, the 50 second penalty is white, but all this time is being wasted, and uh, I'm afraid for him, he won't be back on the medals podium this evening in order to uh, keep his position with inside the top 10 he needs to finish his second run even if it's uh, a not a good one he needs to finish it a sight we saw so often this morning very very tricky from 12 to 13 the end of Costa Luca of Italy now another 
of the big favourites, the world number six, Ivan Bizvec of the Czech Republic. Not so hot in qualifying for the semi-finals. He did that in 35th, 35th place, but a good semi-final run. He's lying joint seventh with Costa. Quick and clean is what they're after. Quick and clean is what Bizvich is producing so far. Well up on the split. Gate 13 safely negotiated. Yeah, the line so far, like its first run, his line so far looked reasonably good. No big time losses. Let's expect him to be well up on this second split time. He is nearly three seconds. He knows he needs to go clean, though. If he has any chance of catching Lefebvre and winning gold. You have seen that gate swinging. I think that was water. It was. The judges haven't given it as a penalty. Here he comes up. 2.18 ahead. 190.10. The new mark to aim for. Bizvec keeping up a great kayak tradition in the Czech Republic. And listen for the roar now. They always get behind the French competitors. Two gold medals in the team events for France. Thomas Monnier, the world number 11, looking to add to the French medal tally here. Yeah, Thomas keen to do well in this event as i said earlier he's uh, he's never really featured that highly on the international scene and um, i think probably this is one of his better performances so far let's see whether he can hold it together for this second run that was very nice to there very delicate through 12 Oh, a silly penalty. Silly penalty round 14. That's not going to help. I think he just avoided it. No, he didn't. He saw it before the judges. the blue ribboned event of the world championships the men's 100 meters final if you like and Monnier in provisional third place there are five still to go Never write off this man. Klaus Sulchenek, ranked number 14 in the world, but a canny competitor. Lying fifth after the semi finals. He's almost exactly five seconds adrift of Lefebvre. Just look at the comparison in style here between uh, this boy and some of the others. He really goes for it. It's, uh, you wouldn't say he's the most graceful athlete. He's attacking all the time. It's quite an unorthodox style. Almost looks out of control in, uh, at times, and I think sometimes it's out of control. But when he gets it together, he's quick. When it clicks, it clicks. It's a little bit late into the...
They seem to be getting a much better handle on this move now. Yes, we were wondering earlier if the course was possibly too difficult, but watching them go down it, having had one shot at it, they seem, as you say, to have, to have got the hang of that 12 to 13, with the uh, unfortunate exception of Costa. So 190.10, the time he's shooting at. He's not going to make it, but puts himself provisionally in second place, 191. 0.61 will it be enough for a place on the podium I have to wait and see nothing he can do about it now the top four and in fourth place after the semi-finals the reigning world champion David Ford of Canada fair to say he's greatly enjoyed his three years as world champion doing the celebrity circuit back home in Vancouver in Canada chat shows talk shows you name it he's done it and I think he fancies another year of that world championships now coming around every year yeah for these last few bolts it's as much a game of mind as it is of body a lot of these guys they know they're so close yet they've seen how easy it is to make mistakes out here it's a it's all about mental discipline and uh, not getting caught up in the emotions and they take a penalty there at gate 12 that's um, that's going to push him down two second penalty how quick is he apart from that one and a half seconds down just over on the split Gate 18. Oh dear. I don't think he's going to be doing the celebrity circuit this year. No, another penalty through 19. It's when the muscles really start to hurt. And I think his heart's gone as well here. Yes, fourth place with three still to come. Disappointment for Ford. He will not be retaining his title. That's where he knew he'd lost it. So then, the top three. Third, after the first run, Mika Terdic of Slovenia. Two penalty seconds in that semi-final run. We can't afford another two, but he is quick. He is me with the second quickest boat to Fabian. And as we said, he was just just under two seconds down on Fabian. So if he can keep it clean, there's always the possibility. Four point two nine seconds is what he's trying to make up. Must go clean. definitely knows there's something at stake here. Mia, when you watch him normally, he's attacking very hard. He's taking things uh, a little more cautiously. Well, he knows, doesn't he, that if he can take provisional first place, he will be taking home a World Championship medal. Lost it a little bit in the middle section. What's he got left in the tank? Just under a half down at halfway there. 190.10, the time of Ivan Pivzek of the Ooh. Czech Republic. He's just inside. Great final section. Mika Terjic knows he's going home with a medal. Plenty of fans out to support him. His family are here too. Will it be bronze? Will it be silver? Can it be gold? Andre Rab 
of the Czech Republic. 3.31 seconds behind Lefebvre after the first run. Can he hold it together oh, for gate a second? Two, that was a penalty gate two for him. As I said before, this is all a state of mind. Some of these... Uh, some of these boys are, uh, are probably going to give this away, not because of the technically not up to it or physically, but because they can't cope with the pressure that is expected of them or they place on themselves. And I think that penalty at gate two was a classic example of that. He'll be kicking himself after this run for that penalty. You know, we haven't seen too many penalties at gate two. But it is, it is difficult. We said that the pressure's on in the semi-finals because 40 go into 10. But once you're in the final, you've got to go for it. You have got to go for it. Mistakes creep in. I mean, you're someone who has won gold. Well, he, he, I'm afraid, will not be winning a medal. That, that does promote his teammate, Ivan Bizvec, onto a definite place on the podium. But a 52-second penalty is not something you really... He'll be so disappointed with that. So many times you can be so close, and yet it, you give it away. How do you handle the pressure? You've won gold at a world <laughs> championship. How did you do it? I've also given gold away as well. Um, as I was saying earlier, it's, a, it's about staying with the moment and not getting caught up, evaluating what's going on. Really, you've just got to be concentrating on what you're doing at the time. If you're starting to evaluate what could happen or what's gone on previous, then uh, it's a recipe for disaster. One gate at a time. So the moment of truth, can he do it in front of his home fans? He's the world number one. Probably the favourite coming into the championship, certainly the hot favourite now. Fabien Lefebvre of France. The Whoop. crowd want him to do it. One penalty here, and uh, I think it puts Mia in with a shout. It's Mia Turdic from Slovenia. It's a real uh, position to be in, knowing that you've got to go play it but knowing also that you've got a couple of seconds to play with. Well, yeah. Oh, he's fast. That he's fast again through that first section. He took a second and a half out of everyone in the semi-finals. He's done exactly the same when it counts most. This, I think, is where it might be won or lost. 11 to 12 to that dreaded gate 13. Here he goes. Oh! So that was so close around the entry pole of 12. You can hear the crowds on the bank willing him down. He's clean and he's well ahead. 5.85 seconds to play with in the last third of the course. This is why he's world number one. He is a man on form. Well, he knew he could take it easy coming into the final. He's done nothing of the sort. He has obliterated the rest of the field by over <laughs> five seconds. Fabian Lefebvre, take about 2002 world champion. Excellent performance from that man. To put two runs together like that, I don't think we've seen many others this so far in the racing put two runs down like that. In yeah. the context of, of this World Championship and, and the difficulties that everyone seemed to experience on this course, those two runs of Lefebvre, I mean, that, that's the stuff of legend, isn't it? It was very good, very impressive, you know, that the, uh, there was very few mistakes on either of those two runs, and we haven't seen much of that from anybody. We've seen individuals go down and put s good single runs together, but to string two together on a course as demanding as that was, uh, it was exceptional, and he deserves that World Championship title. And how? Confirmation then. Gold for France, gold for the world number one. Gold for Fabian Lefebvre, Slovenia silver, and the Czech Republic bronze. They're happy. The fans on the riverbank, they'll hear the Marseillaise once again. That's what they come for. 
a wonderful final of the K1 men. And you couldn't really have a more worthy winner. Fabien Lefebvre for France. Don't go away. We're back after the break. Yeah, no, completely booked. Wednesday. Tuesday, let's see. The NTL Guide from NTL Home not only gives you over 200 pages of cable TV listings. L no. No, no. But also features and special offers. And it's just one pound a month for NTL home customers. Oh, we're very busy. That's Don't miss your favorite yeah. programs. Ridiculous. To subscribe to the NTL Guide, call 0800 052 0463. Mum, how's it going? UK's great. Weather's diabolical. I'm Will. Kids find houses. Look With NTL Home's international call plan, you can call 30 countries from as little as 5 p.m. minutes. Gardening loads, playing cricket, bowl a bit, bat a bit, catch a lot, had a barbie, food with chops, dog ate him. He's okay. Relax. Oh, yeah, by the way, James Britton, I love you there. Bye. From now on, you can spend that little bit longer on the phone. Call 0800 183 0123 to find out how much you could save. NTL Home. One line's all you need. is the place for motor racing. There's the British World Rally Champion. Follow Richard Burns and Colin McRae in every stage. And the All Japan GP. In the American Zone on Sunday nights, Indy car racing as well as NASCAR. More motorsport than any other channel, British Eurosport is the place to be. Welcome back to the River Isère. We're still digesting. That simply awesome performance from Fabien Lefebvre to win the World Championship in the K1 in the kayak. We're going to have a look at the final of the C2. Now, for those of you who aren't avid canoeing fans, let's get a lowdown in exactly what all of this means. K1, C1, C2. Ian, mm -hmm. it sounds complicated, but as we said this morning, it's not really, is it? Uh, the concept isn't complicated. The actual process of paddling them, as we'll see now, is a little bit more difficult. Uh, yeah, the C2, as we can, uh, well, we will see any moment now, is uh, two individuals kneeling in the boat, paddling with a single blade opposed to the kayaks, which we've seen just one moment ago. They sit in the boat and have a double-bladed paddle. Um, both uh, challenging disciplines in different ways. The, uh, the Canadian boats, they kneel and sit a little bit higher, so it's possibly easier for them to see what's coming up. and. Uh, much of canoe slalom is about anticipation, and when you can see what's coming, then it makes anticipation a lot easier. However, that extra height makes them also a little bit more unstable. Uh, I guess like uh, the Canadian, Canadian doubles, they have uh, one blade on either side, so maybe a little bit more stable than the Canadian singles. And just having a look at this fiendishly difficult course in the French Alps. Once again, it's the top 10 in reverse order, the top 10 qualifiers from the semi-finals this morning in reverse order. And uh, as we mentioned this morning, if you are thinking of taking up C2 slalom canoeing professionally or competitively, and if you have a brother, perhaps try and persuade him to come along. Three of the top four from the semi-finals are brothers. And the best of them, the Horshawner twins. Same courses for the kayaks, same rules as well. You hit either of the poles, or both of them, and it's a two-second penalty added to your time automatically. And this pretty much spells disaster. Miss a gate, it's 50 seconds. You can go round and, and have another go at it. And then the 50-second penalty doesn't apply, but by the time you gone back round, it may as well. Again, some big names missing from this top ten. Not least, Wolf and Stepanik of the Czech Republic, world number five, for their confirmation of the top ten from the semi-final. Seal and Pollett of the Czech Republic just squeezing into 10th place. Maybe hoping for a medal. Not such good news for the Roden brothers for Great Britain. 
Let's have a look at how the top three qualified for the final. French pair. You can probably hear the crowd in the background cheering them on. The Lequay brothers. Uh, and Ian, while we watch these, uh, perhaps you could tell those who aren't avid canoeing fans what the different disciplines are and uh, how these guys have to work together. Yeah, with the C2 class, then it's uh, it's all about harmony between the paddlers. Uh, they've almost got to be knowing what each other are thinking before they before they do it. Obviously, they they're getting cues from the water, the way the boat is thrown around gives each paddler an indication of what needs to happen but it's uh, time and experience that allows these guys to uh, perform at the highest level you don't often get crews jumping into uh, even e even athletes that have uh, maybe reached heights in other classes competence in other classes uh, it takes them a little while to get the feel of paddling uh, Canadian doubles um, and as I say it's uh, a discipline that takes many years to master and we see few crews that do. Well this most certainly one of the crews who have mastered it. Pierre and Christophe with Kuwait and France there. Rank number 13 in the world. And qualified third fastest for the final. Those semi-final runs, the first time they'll have seen this course. Six gates were changed between the heats and the semis. But the course is the same from this morning. The semi-final and final over the same course. Now here come the Slovaks. Again, big C1 and C2 tradition in Slovakia. And they're lying first and second after the semi-finals. Kuban on Olenjic, they're second after this run. Yeah, quite, a, quite a feat to uh, put two C2s first and second from the same nation. Slovaks, uh, as you said, are very strong in the Canadian classes, um, and that is the uh, endorsement of that. It's also worth mentioning that we've got three German C2 crews uh, in the final. So from an initial start line of over, uh, over 30 votes, we've still got three German C2 crews left in the top 10. I think that's uh, a, an achievement in itself. It sounds like a, a bad joke, doesn't it? Did you hear the one about the three Germans, the two Slovakians, the two from the Czech Republic? What else have we got? We've got one French boat, one boat from the USA, and one from Great Britain. Britain lying fifth after the semi-finals. So that good enough for second place. But here come the twins. I mean, something of a hash of qualifying for the semi-finals it doesn't matter the times are scratched and they were amongst the earlier starters this morning so they put down a, a marker and no one could better this Peter and Pavel, these twins, amongst the new young guns on the canoeing scene. Just 22 years old, and already ranked world number one and hot favourites to take this title. And this is why. Great first run, they'll start 
one and a half seconds ahead of the rest. So we're live for the final of the men's C2. Top 10 from the semis in reverse order. Aggregate scores added together to find our winners. Here go one of the two. Here goes one of the two check boats. Only 10 seconds adrift after the first run, so they need to go clean to have any chance of a place on the podium. A little bit wild on the start there. You saw the boat being thrown around. That generally suggests that they're, uh, the boat's in the wrong place. It's got water on the tail. As we mentioned before, the, the volume of these boats, there's a compromise between having a big volume boat that keeps the boat on the surface and uh, prevents, prevents it being thrown around by the water, but then also having it thinly cut so you can turn it easily and there is a balance there and what we saw at the top was the uh, was the boat being thrown around a little bit by the water because of the tail being pushed under we saw a two second penalty as well and they could have done without that four penalty seconds in their first run once again difficult to gauge exactly how fast they're going in mean, the first crew down but those two seconds will not have helped their cause any Pospisil and Pollitt of the Czech Republic ranked number six in the world came here hoping to take a medal home but I'm not sure they're going to do that well, they've been regular finishes inside the top five this year. And uh, I would imagine that they were hoping to be on that rostrum. 217.07. If you have a look at some of the times from the semi-finals, I don't think that's going to be enough to see them onto the rostrum unless those that follow have big disasters there. The two-second penalty. Yeah, they Unlucky in many respects. The the bow of the boat just hitting one of those gates. Their, uh, their winning time for the horse runners after the first run was 102.35 and in 10th place 108.18 just to give you an indication of the pace. Ninth place after the semi-finals Scott McCleskey and David Hale he rather of the United States of America rank number 16 two penalty seconds in their semi-final and two already have taken a gate four and some eight and a half seconds to make up from their semi. These boys finished fifth last year in this event, so I'm sure they're, uh, they're hoping to at least match that. Not with penalties like that. I think that chance has gone. For sure it's gone now. That was a 50 at gate 13. Another 50 at gate 13. It's proving tricky. Well, with that 50 second penalty, the split times, and you're rather meaningless. They got in trouble there. Yeah, too far river right. If you're looking downstream through the boat, through the gate, they were too far to the right. That throws the boat onto that rock. That rock has been the bane of so many people's performance over the last few days. So disappointment for the Americans. And they finish 277.12. Yeah, on the public address seat, the system seemed excited, but uh, less so. Messrs. Hepp and McCleskey. Here come one of the three German crews. Ehrenberg and Senft. Many people's fancies, certainly for a medal coming into this world championship in world ranking number two and thoroughly deserved as well. Yeah, I've been on the rostrum twice this year at the uh, some of the early World Cups. The first World Cup in China and then again in Tartan, Slovenia. Third in the Olympic Games in 96. 
so uh, not shy of a good performance. Yes, they know how to turn it on when it matters. And, well, in that early section of the course, they've done just that. Some two, three seconds ahead in the first split. First run 106, but a two-second penalty, so they'll be hoping to go clean on this second run. Just about through gate 13. But from what we've seen of that, any old way will do, won't it? They're clean so far. Let's have a look at their split two-thirds of the way down the course. They should be well ahead, and they are two and a half seconds ahead of the Czech boat. Boss, Bissil, and Pollitt. 217.07 is what the Germans are aiming for. A little bit of time there around that gate. They can't afford to do that. It's these two lying in eighth after the semi-finals. They will take provisional first place. 213.11, nearly four seconds quicker than the Czech boat competitive time will it be good enough for a place on the podium it was a clean run our big rivalry Kai Walter and Frank Henze of Germany rank number three in the world and a powerful accomplished German duo. Yeah, you can see these boys. They've got conviction. They're pushing hard. Throwing the boat around. It's got to be powerful, but it's got to be in control as well. Composure is a key element to this sport. Well, they hit both poles there, but just a one, two second penalty. They've lost a bit of time around there as well. I think they were clear on the first run. So if there's not too much time lost, although they weren't particularly good into the upstream after that penalty either, so there's time given away there. Tight round 14. Now they have to go for it. They know that. They're well down on the split. Yes, two seconds lost to penalties and another three or four lost around gate 11. I think it would be fair to say that this isn't going to be their day. Time in 19 as well. Yes, I don't think that's too controversial. Disappointment for the world number three ranked boat, Walter and Henze of Germany. There was that first two second penalty. And it rather went downhill from there. Second of the Czech boats, Jiras and Mader. Reigning world champions. Yes, reigning world champions, of course. Defending their title. All these world champions have been able to say that they're world champions for three years because last year's event was cancelled in the wake of those tragic events of September the 11th. Yes, and Marder, number seven in the world, qualified sixth for this final. Another clean run. These guys again not shy to throw the boat around there. They're actually not that big guys. They're only around 75 kilos. But um, they seem to be able to maneuver the boat as well as the rest. Put the boat down, put the back of the boat down and lift the bow to help speed the rotation up. And so far so good coming into the final section of the course there. Over two seconds clear. The provisional leaders, the Germans, Ehrenberg and Sent. 
gate 20, gate 21, no penalties. They'll take the lead by three and a half seconds. 209.53, five boats to go. They know what they have to beat. Britain, Germany, France, Slovakia, and Slovakia. Those five boats to come. So far, so good for the Czechs. Every turn, every gear, every rev, every second is captured, analyzed, and adjusted real time with the help of HP ProLiant servers powered by Intel Xeon processors. The intelligence that drives the BMW Williams F1 team to victory. This is the place for motor racing. There's the British World Rally Champion. Follow Richard Burns and Colin McRae in every stage. And the All Japan GP. In the American Zone on Sunday nights, Indy Car Racing as well as NASCAR. More motorsport than any other channel, British Eurosport is the place to be. Welcome back to World Championship Canoeing here on Eurosports. I'm Vassos Alexander, alongside me, former gold medalist at the World Championship and uh, two-time British Olympic team member Ian Raspin. And Ian, I know you've got high hopes for this boat. Bowman and Smith lying fifth after the semi-finals the top five go in reverse order the top ten do the time they're shooting at 209.53 from Yiras and Made of the Czech Republic yeah these boys their uh, the running time on the first was in 103.34 so only a second down on the fastest running time but uh, a penalty and again we saw in the second run a penalty early on they need to keep this run clean if there's any hope of them getting in amongst the medals. Nick and Stu were competent, competent athletes. They won this event last year, so um, there is the possibility of them getting onto the medal rostrum. Have a look at the split. 2.2 seconds down on the Czech boat. They're ranked number 32 in the world, the British duo. I think that's slightly harsh. Nick and Stu, both full-time athletes, supported through the lottery, so uh, they've had the opportunity to be out here a number of occasions. How's that put them second? Second, over two seconds adrift. Well, they just have to wait and see. Now, Simon and Simon of Germany. Four boats to go. K and Robbie Simon. Lying fourth. Almost exactly three seconds adrift of the Slovakian leaders. Have a look so far. Very powerful pair, but just down on the first split. Yeah, the Simon brothers in a very similar position to uh, Bowen and Smith, who were the British crew just down previous. They had a, a reasonably quick time, 103, but two second penalty spoiling that. They need to stay clean. Fast and clean. Clean through 13. Tight through 40. Have a look at their split. It looks good. Are they inside the checks? Just outside. A third of a second to make up in the last third of the race or so. Germany, as you say, with three boats inside the top ten in this final. 
disappointment for the other two. That's a clear run so far. Yes. Clear second run. A little bit off the pace. They're going to second place. 212.48 and 209.53 is looking better and better and better from Miras and Mada of the Czech Republic. Big cheer can only mean one thing. There's a French boat on the water and it's the Lecue brothers, Pierre and Christophe. All three of these last three crews went clean on the first run, so uh, it's, it's their natural raw speed that's going to uh, make the difference here. Yeah, so far so good. Two seconds up in the first split. Is that a penalty? I don't think so. There's time there, though. That was really good. Yeah, about as good as we've seen through uh, yeah. 12 and then 13 and 14. As good as some of the kayaks through that section. Here comes the split. You're right. It wasn't a penalty. They should be well ahead. And they are. Nearly one and a half seconds. The French can feel something big coming on. Well, they know if they take provisional first place, they will be on the podium. Can they keep it clean this last gate? Yes, they have. Now, what time are they going to post? They are just going to go into the lead. 2.09.41. They know they've got a medal. And they, they're happy. I know they're going to hear the Marseillaise after the final of the K1 we saw live on Eurosport. But here come the two Slovakian crews. Kuban on Oleznik, rank number four in the world. And a, a good second ahead of Lukue and Lukue after the first run. Interesting to see the back guy there with, a, with what we call a, a pogi on a glove. Basically, just to keep his hands warm, even though the air temperature here is, is in around the 20s, the water temperature is straight off the, uh, the meltwater. So he uh, decided to keep his hands warm with, with a glove. And I have to say, I don't blame him at all. Eight degrees centigrade, the water temperature. You wouldn't catch me swimming in that. But slow through the first sector. They've lost their seconds advantage. And the French were mighty impressive through here and not so the Slovaks valuable timing given away there it wasn't a bad contingency plan at gate 13 but they didn't really follow it up into 14 and I think we, we will see here there's time given away oh yes they're clean but they were slow through that tricky midsection four and a half seconds they're not going to make that up in the last third of the race so the french french brothers no they'll have silver if not gold german brothers no they'll have bronze if not silver do we have a podium of three sets of brothers i wonder Disappointing second run. The world number four ranked boat. And finish out of the medals. Well, here come the twins. Peter and Pavel. Who are sure enough? By far the best in the first run. And they put two in a row together. They are ranked world number one. They are Olympic champions, they are European champions. Can and they there. also be world champions? You heard the, the cheer from the crowd. They won a French gold medal, and that's a two-second penalty early on. Point ten down. 
as they come into the middle section. Wonderful talent working together really as a team. Again, look at the precision in which they place the blade there. Some of these crews putting their heads down and really pulling hard. These guys still got the power, but it's all precision stuff. They're placing the blades. They are placing the blades. And despite another two-second penalty, they're that quick. They're half a second up going in to the last third of the race. What can they do from here? It's up for grabs. Will it be France or will it be Slovakia? 209.41 is what they're aiming at. It's about four seconds from this drop. I think they're going to do it. They are going to do it. What a wonderful third section from them. Wow. Wow. In the end, it was easy. 3.2 seconds. Oh, they just confirmed their wonderful talent. The French with silver. And it will be three brothers, or three sets of brothers, on the podium. You'd have to say, like the men's kayak, it's the horse owners who've dominated this season so far, and they've proved yet again today that they are the best crew. Oh, in fact, Simon and Simon just miss out on a medal for Germany, and it is Jiras and Marder of the Czech Republic who take bronze. But, as you say, Horshauna and Horshauna have uh, been the best in the world, and they've proved that here in the French Alps. They've taken gold. It's been a wonderful day for the fans by the riverside. It's been a wonderful day for the Horshauna twins. World Championship gold medalists, and what a future these two have. It's the bronze medal run of Yiras and Marder. They'll be pleased with that after qualifying six and from the final. Yeah, I'm sure these guys were hoping to hang on to their uh, World Championship title, but to come away with third is not bad. It's always a dream to hang on to uh, in a sport like this, as, uh, as you've seen today and over the previous four days. Uh, unlike track and field and some of the other sports, it's not as predictable as maybe some of those sports. You can be on form and one minute you're on the rostrum and next minute you're in 20th position. In a way, that's part of the beauty of the sport, but also creates a lot of frustration and a lot of tears. A spirited defence of their world title, though, from the Czech pair. And they'll go home with another world championship medal. I wonder where they'll put theirs. Yours, Ian, you were telling me, is in a cardboard box somewhere in your attic. <laughs> that's where it was last time, yeah, we are in the midst of unpacking, having moved house recently, but it will take pride of place when uh, eventually we get round to, uh, to unpacking all, all our belongings. They do like getting in picture, these British fans. There aren't too many of them here, but they've come with their flags and they're making an awful lot of noise. And the cameraman seems to like them, keeps picking them out. These are the fan favourites. Not the British fans' favourites, but nearly all of the rest of the 6,000 packing the riverbank. For the QA brothers of France, they nearly did it, didn't they? A silver for them. And another formidable pairing. Yeah. It's a, a great performance. The French trying to live up to uh, a crew that recently retired, Addison and Ford, who... Uh, had Olympic medals, world medals, and World Cup medals. And uh, we thought it would be a while before the, uh, the French put together another crew of uh, equal competence, but these guys have uh, shown today that they're up for the challenge.
very good through that section. It'll be interesting to see their final little section because they lost a lot of time to the Slovaks in this last section. If we can spot any obvious errors. I think there's possibly a little bit of time in the upstream here, but... Not too much. No, no, no. A little bit of setting up there, but nothing massive. And maybe got over a little bit too far right there. There was a little bit of time just to drop over there, but... It was still good enough. Yeah, they knew then that they definitely had a place on the podium. It's great, of course, competing in front of your home fans. It does have its own intrinsic pressures, though. It's an endorsement to the French system. The, the French have a great system. They have uh, professional club coaches that encourage the kids into the canoes and give them the basics, and then when they've mastered that, they move on and get some support at a regional level before, if they're good enough, getting onto the, the national program. Well, Slovakia just keeps producing them. Not a great start from the Twins. But simply awesome speed. Can these two dominate for years and years and years? Well, they're only, twin, I think, twi 22 or 23 now, so uh, you would think that there's a, a distinct possibility. We've uh, had an ongoing debate of what the prime age is for a uh, slalom canoeist and we've got David Ford in men's kayak who's 33, 34 years old and uh, we've seen today Fabian at 23 years old winning the uh, world championships so the spread of 10 years there so I think any ideas that we once had about mid-twenties being the right age is um, no longer the case Early to mid-twenties, we'll call them. These two, the twins, Peter and Pavel. They've dominated the season. They've dominated here in the French Alps. And they'll go home to Slovakia, proudly carrying gold medals. They deserve it. So a wonderful afternoon down by the riverside. France have won the K1 gold medal. Slovakia, the C2. We're back tomorrow for the final of the women's K1. We'll also have a look at the K1 team event. And that's straight after this program. It was yesterday. Always a treat to see the team events in this format. It's only at a World Championship that you'll ever see that. Three boats desperately trying to get all three of them down past the finishing post within 15 seconds of each other. But today was the day of the youngsters for France and Slovakia. Thanks.
to some of the coming highlights. The US Open, the Vuelta, the Track Worlds and the Euro 2004 qualifiers. British Eurosport in September. British Eurosport is the place for motor racing with World Superbikes. 13 rounds and we've got every one. There's the stars of motocross, a full season of MotoGP and a brand new superstar, Valentino Rossi. World Rally has a British champion. Follow Richard Burns and Scottish challenger Colin McRae for every stage throughout the season. There's the legendary Le Mans 24 hours and some of the tightest saloon car racing in the All Japan GP. The Super Racing Weekends have five motorsport events in just one meeting. Sunday night means the American Zone for Indy Car Racing, America's Formula One and NASCAR. Nights of Thunder out on the ovals. More motorsport than any other channel. So if you love motor racing, British Eurosport is the place to be. Eight teams to come, I should say, lying eighth after the first run. The Australian trio, Lachlan Milne, Warwick Draper and John Wilkie. Two penalty seconds Ooh. after their first run. But already almost injury there into uh, gate four. These guys are all based in uh, Penrith, just north of Sydney in Australia. Train and, uh, train and live around the site of the Olympics in uh, 2000. All looked after by uh, XGB athlete Richard Fox, five times world champion. So uh, I'm sure Richard's on the bank, willing them down. So far, so good, it appears. Let's see uh, when the split appears. Oh, well, I couldn't have been... 100 seconds of penalty. Further wrong. I, I didn't notice to... Uh, Some of these calls, them. very fine lines. Yes, in this case. I, I guess those were very tight calls. Are, are there any disputes ever? I mean, is there an official procedure if you if you dispute a call, or is... Yes, there is, and, uh, and, and, and I have to say that with uh, some of the 50-second calls, then, uh, as we were saying earlier, the margins can be very fine and um, for a 50 second penalty to be awarded the athlete doesn't always hit the pole um, if, they're, if, they're, if they're seen by the judges for their head to be the wrong side of the pole that's 50 seconds and consequently that's what happened there two 50 second penalties that we, we didn't spot them yeah well the judges have eagler eyes than we do the australians down in seventh place Lavakia, remember the team to be currently and uh, well, the roar you can hear is from 6,000 French canoeing fans willing their team on. They saw their C2 team take gold in magnificent style earlier this afternoon. Their K1 team, Thomas Monnier, Badois, Pechier and Fabien Lefebvre. Seventh place after the first run, six penalty seconds. Be interesting to see whether these boys can hold it together. The French in the past have had a, a little bit of a reputation to be all or nothing. I, a win or it, uh, or it goes out the window. Um, but under the guidance of Sylvain Carinier, who uh, is now the national French kayak coach, I think he's quieting things down a little bit. And certainly these top two guys, uh, Fabien and um, Benoit, Benoit Pesce, are uh, certainly established themselves over the last two years in their individual class. And I would imagine today will do also pretty good. Well, you mentioned all or nothing. We saw that very well, very well exemplified Four in C1. Four seconds up. Four seconds up at this stage. Four seconds up and clean so far. The Slovakian time is the one they're uh, they're aiming for. Remember that C1 race when they dropped the paddle and the C2 when they were just simply brilliant and uh, came away with a gold medal. That's all or nothing. Let's see uh, whether this one's all or nothing. Four seconds up at the split, coming towards the end of their second run. Roared home by the six thousand strong crowd 
here in the French Alps. We're between Les Arcs and Tignes. Clean run. And but the French will take the lead. Will that be good enough? 218.25. That is a pretty good marker to come to put down with six teams to come. 218.25. They know what they're aiming at. It's the USA in sixth after the first run. who were first to have a crack at that time. I think, Ian, that that's a pretty good time that the French have uh, posted there. Yeah, I was just looking at the uh, the run for the, the first time runs, and uh, yeah, I'd say that that's, that's going to be difficult to beat. Um, the best of the first time runs were Italy, who went clear, 104.89, put it 105 seconds. So they've got... Uh, well, 10 or so seconds to play with, but uh, that looked pretty fast from France. And clean. And here come the USA into that tricky midsection. Let's see how this trio copes with it. Scott Shipley, Brett Hale, and Scott Parsons through gate 12. Now, was that a miss? Apparently not. I don't believe so, no. He, um, he managed to get his head inside. Oh, the it was. No, it's been given. It's been given as a miss, yeah. Very fine line, as you were saying. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not judging. And they can't be very popular, the judges. It's not the sort of thing you want to go out for a drink with afterwards. Oh, thanks for giving me that 50 seconds. I thought I was inside it. Yeah, there are uh, a number of occasions where there has been uh, some dispute over penalties that made significant difference on the... Uh, in terms of final seedings. Well, here come the USA then. With that 50-second penalty, there goes their hope of the gold medal. So France still in pole position. The USA fourth after the second run, so they won't get a medal. Next, it's Holland, the Netherlands. Sam Oud, Gupto Koopmans and Floris Brat. Their trio in the K1 men's team final. After Holland, just four teams left to go in their second run down, down the course. Oh. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. It seems as though the, uh, the first man into gate four disappeared. I don't know, unless he was remarkably quick. No, it seems as though he's had problems. I think the Dutch, the Dutch effort is, a, is, is really gone to the wall. Yeah, very early in the course as well. We've seen uh, people struggle through the midsection, but... Uh, Rarely up at the top of the course. We'll wait to see for the official judge's verdict because uh, sometimes we've called something as a 50-second penalty <laughs> and they haven't, and sometimes uh, we haven't and they have. So uh, who are we to, to argue with the officials down by the riverside? So uh, we'll know when the split comes up exactly how the Netherlands team are faring in their second run. I have a feeling that you're right, Ian. I have a feeling mm -hmm. that it's all gone wrong. And there, there is confirmation that's a fourth 50 second penalty and uh, well i'm afraid that they'll do well to get into the top 10 here let alone the, the top three mm, surprising really because the dutch are particularly the uh, samud and uh, floris bright the first and the third athlete there well established kayak paddlers and that french time is looking better and better and better they lead 218.25 as Holland come, uh, come home rather disconsolately after those 202 penalty seconds. France in the lead, next to come Germany, Great Britain, the Czechs and Italy. Late August in New York City and the sporting spotlight turns to Flushing Meadow. Keep your eye on the ball because it's Grand Slam time, the US Open. We have it covered from every angle with all the info you need on the Eurosport News Channel and Eurosport.com. The US Open, live from Flushing Meadow, every day from Monday on British Eurosport. With Kia, the car that cares.
four teams left to go. Germany lying fourth after the first run. It was a clean first run from them. 108.20. If they can do that again, they will just move ahead of France into first position with three teams left to go. But that French time, that clean French time in their second run, with all the pressure that these guys are under, coming to this, the business end of the men's K1 team final, well, that French time is looking pretty hard to beat. Again, no lack of uh, experience here. You've got Thomas Schmidt leading the Germans down. Thomas, Olympic champion in 2000 in the men's kayak class. And then behind, sorry, in third place, Thomas Becker, who was a uh, world champion in 1997 and uh, a bronze medal in 96, I believe, at the Olympic Games. Yes, in Atlanta. Two seconds of penalties. They're still inside the French team time just. French team time just. Ooh. Very tight there. Very tight. Three gates to negotiate. 218.25 is the time they're aiming at. When the third man goes through, a very, very fast and very, very competent and strong second run from Germany. They take pole position four seconds or so ahead of the French. It won't be double golden joy for the home fans, but here come Great Britain again. A good, clean first run, but they'll have to match it if they're going to win a place on the podium. Fourth place, remember, in the C2 event earlier this afternoon see how the British trio get on in the kayak. Paul Ratcliffe, Campbell Walsh, Anthony Brown making up the British team, lying third after the first run. All three of these guys I know uh, reasonably well. Paul Ratcliffe leading Leading the team down, he uh, silver medalist at the Olympics in 2000. Then in second place, Campbell Walsh, who was fourth at European Championships three weeks ago. And Anthony Brown, bringing up in the third position. Guy from Durham, and not far from uh, my hometown. All well-established international athletes. And capable of getting in amongst the medals here if uh, they can hold it together. Paul certainly will be on a mission because, like um, two of his closest rivals didn't qualify for the uh, final semi-final and final on Sunday that was a massive setback for him and for the British team Paul was uh, a, a, a certain medal hopeful and uh, yeah well I'm sure he, uh, he he would like to take something home and this is, is going to be his only opportunity well as you saw a two second penalty that came on gate 14 and a bit slow putting them up the judges here I don't think they're going to go ahead of Germany. <sighs> they're not, because there was another two-second penalty. Will they just squeak in ahead of France? No, just below France. Great Britain provisionally third, France second, Germany first. There are two teams left to go on the water. And lying second after the first run, the Czech Republic. Andrej Rab, Yuri Bresnavec, and Ivan Piz. Jack. I don't think I pronounced those names entirely fluently here, but I think you know who I'm talking about. They're a good, strong team as well. Yeah, for sure. The uh, the Czechs are uh, always a dominant force. You would never you would never write them off. And as we can see um, with their position now, they're uh, certainly in amongst it. Seem to be giving each other a little bit more space than some other teams. That's uh, that's key here. If you end up on top of each other, then it just makes the uh, the situation even worse. That looks 
good so far. No poles swinging, that's a good sign. So far, so good. Five one hundredths of a second in it at the split time. It's uh, Well, it's anyone's. It all depends on that final section of the course, the section that the Czech Republic are just entering gate 18. Upstream, then back through the green gate at 19. And then it's all eyes on the clock. The French waiting in anticipation.